Hi everybody, here we are, chapter eight. We're halfway through the semester and we're making great time. So what we're tackling now is the final declension of nouns. So we've learned the first declension, which tended to end with alpha or eta, and that eta was always long, but alpha could be either long or short. Um, and then we also had our second declension nouns, which in the masculine ended with os, or in the feminine, as in uh, nesos. Uh, but then the masculine version was logos. And then finally, we also had the neuter, which could end in aw or maybe on. Uh, we had dendron was the kind of primary example. That aw was with when we had something like tall, the, the definite article. So that was the first declension, and that, then the second declension of nouns. Now we're getting to the third, and this already comes with a bit of a, of a caveat uh, that really we should watch out because because these are going to do a lot of different things with a lot of different endings. We, we call this one declension, a third declension, but really there are tons of things going on. However, we are going to be able to schematize this in some way that is constant for all third declension nouns, and that's what 8.1 in Shelmerdeen is about. In practice, things are going to look very different, but underneath it all, we're always going to be getting back to these same basic principles, and that's why it's important to hit them first. So I'm going to draw the kind of chart that you're all very familiar with now. Nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, vocative in the singular, then the nominative, and I'm just going to go down to the just the first letter for the plural. It's the kind of dividing line. And now we're going to have differences between the masculine and feminine, which in the third declension seem tend to get bunched together and have the same endings, which are distinct from the neuter endings. So within the nominative, we're, we're likely to get either a sigma as an ending or nothing at all. That these are the two kind of common possibilities of an ending for a third declension noun in the nominative. Neuter also will get nothing. Uh, the genitive is going to be handy. It's this Omicron Sigma, which on the one hand that's frustrating, that looks a lot like masculine singular or second declension singular logos or nasos, but we're going to see it come up in the genitive and mean different things. This is fine. This won't be too much of a hassle. In the dative, we're going to have a short iota in both the masculine feminine chart and the neuter chart. That's great. And then in the accusative, we're going to have a short alpha. Again, that's a little frustrating. That looks a bit like maybe the, uh, the neuter plurals of the uh, nominative, accusative, or vocative sort. We'll get to this. It's not going to be too bad, uh, but this is a kind of new ending. And then neuter is going to be, well, we have this easy rule, nominative, accusative, and vocative, always the same. And in this case, it's blank, so that's easy. And then vocative, also same. Here, we either have the end with a sigma or just nothing at all. In the plural for the masculine and feminine, we're going to be having things end in epsilon sigma. This will look familiar to those who have done Latin and have seen so many things that end in es in the third declension. These are related declensions. There's no fourth or fifth declension in Greek as there is in uh, Latin, but the third declension bears some similarities. And the neuter, we're going to have a short alpha. Again, this is going to be frustrating, but we'll get over it. And then the genitive, our favorite, omega nu. It's just what, what happens in Greek. And the dative, we're going to end with, you've noticed that almost all these, except for the nominative, have been vowels. Now we're going to have a ending that ends with sigma, a short epsilon, and then a nu, and that's a nu movable. And that's going to happen on both sides of the aisle. So an ending in C or sin, depending on context. So both short iotas. And then, again, as always in the plural, the vocative is as the nominative. So in this case, it's epsilon sigma. And then in this case, short alpha. Oh, so I, I skipped here. Uh, we will want the uh, accusative plural. Sorry, so that's all the vocative down there. Accusative plural is short alpha sigma. This needs to be carefully distinguished from first declension, long alpha sigma endings in the nominative or in the accusative plural feminine. 
or, or nouns like neonias, that which were masculine but first declension. This is important. This is why I was highlighting this earlier, that that was long, because this is coming and this is short. But then as nominative, again, our kind of handy neuter rule, where the nominative always equals the accusative, which equals the vocative, in both the singular and plural, and then in masculine and feminine, vocative always equals the nominative. So this is the fundamental schema that we can apply to all of these third declension nouns. Now what's going to get become problematic is the stem. What we're going to be attaching these to will run the gamut of what we'll have kappas, we'll have taws, we'll have vowels, we'll have all sorts of things. And because of that, we're going to get some changes of how these things look on the page or in the print in the print or in as people are vocalizing these things in ancient Greece. But the thing to remember is that this will apply to all of them. We're just going to have to learn different rules for, of how these parts can play together. But the important things to know is one, well, let me get a, another color, bright magenta, for things to take away. First is that masculine and feminine tend to be identical in their formation. This is nice. This instead of having the, those three different types of adjectives, for example, now we just have a masculine feminine chart and a neuter chart. Also nice about the neuter is that it's very regular and there's so many that overlap, so we're really not learning too many parts. A trick is going to be looking at that short alpha sigma and also these sigma iota nu endings will become a little bit tricky as we go, but these owns are great. Um, those are familiar to us. This is also going to be a little bit tricky. But we'll take care of all of these things in due time, I promise. This will all also make much more sense as we actually get started with actual stems and actual words. So that's going to be our next bit. Well, actually, let me pause and talk about different combinations. And we've already seen some of this as we've been going through Greek. But, but we have these different types of consonants. We have labials. And now I'm looking at Shelmerdine, page 40, the very top. And we have dentals. And we have palatals, and then finally we have nasals. All of these terms referring to the different parts of the kind of oral system that allows us to pronounce language. So labials from labium in, in Latin, the lips. So these are consonants that use lips. So let me write consonant types up here. Give that kind of a box it off. That's what we're talking about. Dentals, of course, being teeth. Palatals, dealing with the palate, the, the top of our mouth, the roof. And then nasals, of course, dealing with the nose. Poorly spelled, but nose. There we go. All right, so our labials, and you can kind of sound through them, are p, which is unvoiced, b, which is voiced, and then we have the aspirated f, uh, which really, of course, for the ancient Greeks was pronounced like a pa versus a, an unaspirated pa. Um, so these are our labials, and when we combine these all with the sigma, as we've seen before, we get psi. Dentals, again, we're going to follow the same pattern, an unvoiced and then a voiced duh. All it is, the same thing as the T, approximately. My, my tongue actually moves a little bit, but then voiced. And then the aspirated T is, of course, the theta. All of these things, when combined with sigma, equal sigma. The dental basically gets lost in the mix. The labial was a little bit stronger. Palatals, this was our kappa. And then when the kappa was voiced, it was our gamma. And then when it was aspirated, we had our chi. These, when we add them together with a sigma, we get xi, right? And then nasals, we have mu, nu, and then we also had some of those double consonants, which I haven't really talked about, especially on these video lessons, but this is ing, that's much like our ng, somewhat similar to uh, Spanish ny, ng. Then we have a ing, uh, where we, we get a little bit of a palatal kind of guttural at the end, and then we also have that in its aspirated form. But all these are nasals because we're getting that ng mm or mm sound. So mu, nu, and then gamma, 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 kappa, and gamma, chi. Those all together plus sigma equal gamma, xi. 
So, I mean, that kind of makes a certain amount of sense. These are the different combinations that we're going to be seeing popping up. This is where, this is the end of the word, for example, sphinx. In English, we translate this as an X, which is, you know, strange that that's a gamma, but it, it becomes nasalized, and it really is, in effect, an X. So sphinx is a third declension noun. We're going to be getting to that in this chapter. Well, not sphinx exactly, but we're, we're building the basis for what will lead us to talk about the Greek Sphinx and a lot of other things. Uh, so join me in the next episode. We're going to be talking about the third declension nouns that end in either kappa or ta. Uh, Kerux for herald, and then soma for body. Uh, lots of inter interesting things to say. We'll see you then.